Pictures up. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Robert from Machado Visuals, and today I'm joined by my two filmmaking brethren, Hassani and Alberto. Um, for those that don't know you, give yourselves an intro and maybe tell us about some of the work you guys do. Uh, I am Hassani Johnson, and I am an independent filmmaker located here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I am a frequent collaborator of... Of? <laughs> Alberto Triana, sorry. <laughs> right. I am terrible at this. Um, yeah, I'm Alberto Triana. I'm also a uh, local independent filmmaker here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I've uh, been just working here for the last 10 years. So within the realm of filmmaking, like what do you guys do specifically? Do you guys direct, DP? I mean, I know, Sonny, you guys, you dabble in a little bit of everything, but do you guys, do you guys uh, consider yourself to specialize in, in, a, in one particular area? Um, in terms of uh, like specializing, I, I tend to want to specialize in like directing, cinematography, that type of thing. Uh, but I do know sound. I have my own sound kit. It's not that great, but I know how to use it. Mm-hmm. So I've been in situations where I've worked sound, editing, color, all that type of stuff. Because you do some AC work too. Yeah, and yeah. I think the one thing that we worked together on, you were a, uh, you were a grip was, or gaffer? I, w- I was, was both. It, <laughs> <laughs> grip it was gaffer, one of those, sh- you know, when gaffer. it's a, yeah, yep, exactly. When you're on a shoot like that, you just do everything. You're like, hey, do this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Sonny? Um, I don't know. I, I embrace the term independent filmmaker. I love filmmaker because I I not only love doing everything on set uh, I don't think I would be able to go too long without doing several different tasks I, I think I would get bored yeah, yeah. Uh, I was a gymnast growing up and gymnastics was like the only sport that could really captivate me because you did something different every day that's it was cool, yeah. six different events that's why I like CrossFit <clears throat> yeah <laughs> like you do so much stuff it's so different so I mean I love to write if I go too long without writing then I'll I'll kind of start to I it'll call to me like I'll need to like stop doing other mind. things yeah. yeah so I tend to cycle I like part of the year I'll spend writing part of the year I'll spend just focusing on stepping up my visuals and everything that goes with that mm-hmm. and then I'll jump to sound and then post so it it's you know month by month um I'll become different things basically and i know that sounds weird but yeah i so you know sometimes i feel like that way because i i I consider myself to kind of specialize in cinematography and like i don't really dabble in too many other things but like sometimes when when work is slow and i don't have a lot of jobs i'll like like you said i'll just go crazy Mm -hmm. sitting around at home and i just i'll like literally lose my mind and it's (laughs) like it's sometimes it's just a hump you got to go over get over but um so it's not you have a lot of kind of experience under your belt. So where did you get your start in visual storytelling? Um, I started making movies when I was 12 years old with, with my buddies. Um, most of those films were just like us. We were all gymnasts. So we just flip around. We were big Kung Fu fans. Kind of like how skaters do it. Exactly. It it was that, you know, stuff at the beach, you know, wipeouts sometimes at the gym, sometimes just the middle of the street. Um, that we were all kind of broke. So like we could go to like big, like block parties and do flips and people would give us money. What? So we would be able to get like dinner that way sometimes. And the videos, we started the the just filming ourselves do back flips and front flips on concrete and things of that nature and in different places. And it was that, just mostly for you guys, just yep. you know, something fun to do. And then we just we did a fight scene uh, and I edited it at school. And when we came to school a couple of days later, I guess our other classmates had found it and started inviting people in. So we went viral at school in oh, the nineties. Yeah. Was this college I, or high school? <clears throat> this was this was high school. I think it was like freshman or sophomore year. Oh, wow. And we realized it was my best friend who was like, "We need to do more of this. We need to make a bigger film." Mm-hmm. And we just almost every year we would make a film, uh, just like a big group of jocks who had cool like skills, and we were improvise the movies. We wouldn't even write s- scripts. Oh, we would wow. improvise the movies based on what this person can do and this person can do yeah, and yeah, give yeah. them a character and then we'd put them in theaters. We would rent out movie theaters for the entire weekend and the 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 movie theater would get our money for the rental and the concessions, we would get the box office and we would leave with enough money to go have fun for the rest of the summer wow. off of one film. And we did that until middle of college basically and then how'd you guys out like advertise that for for people to come in and and see your movie (laughs) the local news would cover us and that's when people would just start spilling in um we had done it so much and we were kind of known as the film kids that we could go to i went to a, a private school in milwaukee wisconsin called university school in milwaukee and 
all of the other high schools, even our rival school, which was kind of like homesteadish, you know, it was like a school called Homestead, a couple miles away. They would let us put posters for our movies up at their school. Oh, cool! And then we we could go to you know a totally different district, you know, kids that you know we went there for like home, their homecoming and things of that nature, and when they would let us put up posters, so. I think it was just all of the local high schools. We just kind of had friends at all of those schools and knew the teachers and they would let us advertise there. That's dope. That sounds so, so much fun. Just like, hey, come see our movie. And- it was, man. Yeah. It was It was wild times. It was, <clears throat> we would start at the beginning of summer and like summer was this liberating time. You know, every kid knows yeah, that. Yeah, you, yeah. You, all you want to do is stay up later than you could, than you're supposed to and get up earlier, you make the, make the most out of your days. Yeah, so maximize we would, the freedom. Yep. Mm-hmm. We would, we would shoot all night. And once again, we had no script. So we would like shoot from like 5 PM until like three in the morning, look for any parties that were like sizzling out, fall asleep at somebody else's house, go home, <laughs> edit, hit the gym, go shoot again the next day Damn. or just brainstorm the next day. And it was just a big group of guys. I remember my mom used to get upset because her couch would have indentations from like all my football <laughs> buddies <laughs> sleeping on the couch so much. And we would travel with our PC wow. so we can set it up at any house we were at and just mm. wake up and edit. Holy so cow. Was, and at that nice. point, you know, you're talking about like big honking yep. machinery. What was it? A Sony yeah. Vio. We had a Sony oh, Vio man. we all chipped oh in God. for and we, we would put that in the trunk of our car. Are you getting a DV? Mm. We were shooting on two or three mini DV cameras we borrowed from people. Oh, wow. And we thought we were killing it because we had three cameras. <laughs> we, we should have had a script first. <laughs> <laughs> so, had a solid game plan, yeah. maybe. But that's where it started for me. That's pretty cool. Yeah, what um, about you? Yeah, I grew up in Hawaii, uh, started shooting videos like around 13, 14 years old. Okay. My dad had a camera. It was like a high 8 camera. And me and my buddies, we would just you know meet up on the weekends or when we weren't, you know, not in school and just shoot videos like parody type stuff, fake trailers, uh, fake music videos. And it was just a lot of fun. And it just, uh, it just clicked. Like the moment we shot our first video, it's like, this is what I want to be doing. You know, mm-hmm. I wrote, I wrote a script, directed it. And even though it was just us, you know, so I had to act in it too, which I try not to <laughs> for obvious <laughs> reasons, but, um, you know, it was fun. And then, you know, it was one of those moments that I just kind of knew this is what I want to be doing. Yeah. And I'm fortunate that at a young age, I was able to decide that and like know that because I feel like a lot of people just wander and they stumble into it. I am like, I am, I'm right there with you. I think I actually think about that a lot. And like, you know, I was, I was shooting on a club last week and like some people, like I had like two or three people, Hey, I got a camera. I'm trying to get into this. How, Mm. like, how do you recommend? And I was like, well, one, I've knew, I knew I wanted to get into this at an, at a, early age. Mm-hmm. And so I'm so grateful for that because like from like all of my decisions, like in my twenties have just been focused around this career and going to college and like the, all, like everything has kind of been centered around film. And like, especially now if you're trying to get into the game and like, if you're older, it's, it is a lot mm-hmm. harder because yeah. you have so many other responsibilities <laughs> and you have other things like some, you have some, some people have kids to worry about. Some people yeah, have a yeah, mortgage absolutely. to worry about. And yep. it's like, you have all these other responsibilities and, and to get started, it, it, it's really hard. It, not saying that it can't be done, but you know. it is tough. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, what helped out with that was just going through high school, going straight into college with a game plan, knowing exactly what I wanted to do. Yeah. Help pave the way like dude, so fast. And so the same helpful. way you said, like everything we do, it's just, it's always in the back of your mind, every decision you make. And, you know, even, even from a social standpoint, like things that I do, even the friends that I have, like, mm-hmm. And it wasn't by choice. It just naturally happens that way. I mean, you start doing your thing and you surround yourself with people like like minded people. Yeah. And, you know, you just form these great relationships. And honestly, one of the things I love about what we do in the film and television like business, <clears throat> I feel like you can work with somebody once on a job and you don't see them for like a year or two. But you somehow develop <laughs> this like brotherhood and like this, this yeah. friendship with them. And you show up on set two years later and it's you step back in like you never missed a yeah, beat and it's, like nothing changed. it's amazing. Like I love that aspect of what we do. Mm-hmm. That is awesome. So did you go through the UNLV film program? Oh uh, yeah, I did two years and then I just stopped. So when was that? <laughs> uh, 2008, 2009. Okay. I was, uh, yeah. So before I, my time. Yeah, I, I did. I, I saw you, I saw that, that you wrote that somewhere and I was like, dang, I had no, I, I just had no idea, <laughs> but it was obviously before my time. So yeah, tell me about that. I yeah. Like, I, um, well I came, um, originally I was playing football and uh, I was going to play f- football in Chicago, but the school that 
I was supposed to go to didn't have like a good film program. Mm. So I decided to, you know, go to UNLV and my roommate who I met in theater, he's a writer. I was a director. We were like, Hey, we work well together. So we just, you know, doing that. Uh, his name is Brent Mukai, comedian, funny dude. Um, but yeah, so came up here, started doing some classes and I don't know, I got to that point where I started working already and I was doing <clears throat> editing jobs to get started and I was missing jobs because I had to go to class. And Dude, I was, <laughs> right, I was there a year ago. Yeah. It was the worst. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to, and it was, it was really tough too because some of my classes, like some of them, especially, it does make sense, the, the, the later film classes have, you know, attendance policies, mm-hmm. you know, rightfully so, come to class, get your grade. Yep. But it's like sometimes I would have to, and like you had a quota, You'd like you can miss X amount before we drop your grade. You have X amount before you, we give you an F. And I'm like, dude, like I had to make the decision between, you know, coming to class or making rent. And I was like, ah, uh. so mm, I'm so tough. glad. It's tough. So mm. glad I'm done with that now. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like now I'm so much more free. And uh, anyways, um, so Hassani, what are your like feelings towards film school? Um, I mean, it, it really just, I think it depends. Absolutely. Uh, it 100% Absolutely. wasn't for me. Interesting. Uh, Why is that? Um, I've I think my basis was uh, I was kind of adopted by a uh, well I was adopted by a, a master photographer. Oh, okay. And so you had that mentorship kind of life was cool. Nice. Like it was a lot more free flowing. Cool. I like that. And um, like I was surrounded by it to a certain extent. Uh, becoming a professional artist was not a foreign idea. Because I was watching it happen, I had seen how wonderful his life was and how happy he was. Even when the money went away, he was still really happy. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, school, I went. I was lucky enough to go to one of the best private schools ever for like my primary education. Basically, when it came to college, I think I just kind of felt felt weighed down by it. And networking, they say film school is good for networking, but as Bert just said. Working is good for networking Absolutely, as well. Absolutely, yeah. So, like, it's great for that. And to be honest, the friends that you would make in college, I don't think you would not necessarily make those friends because they're planning on they're ending working. up where you're yeah. at. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, the networking argument or side of it doesn't really hold weight with me. Mm-hmm. It really depends on how your brain works. Uh, some people need the structure. Yes. Some people mm-hmm. need the pressure. Some people need the prodding. I don't. I actually, I, I flounder. When Flounder. someone is, like yeah, that. I really do. I, I suck at having someone stand over me and tell me what to do. It's yeah. just not the way I learn. Mm. Um, and I think it goes back to like my dad just kind of being like, uh, you should do that better. So go figure out how to do it. Just kind of that everything, yeah, yeah, everything's right there. Or if it's not, go figure out what it is you need. Huh. And like I come back and I, the biggest thing I thank him for is for not coddling me. You know, like yeah. he, he, he was really quick to say that sucked. Do it again. Like even with my movies, we would make so much money and I would be on cloud nine cause I had cash in my hand and he'd be like, so you never saw a shot you didn't like, huh? And I'd be like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and he'd be like, kind of like Ed Wood. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> and, uh, Dang. you know, but he was the only person who was real with me about it. I think everybody else was just enamored by the idea sure. that you got mm. it done sure. with him. And the you made money was higher. Yeah. yeah. And even the standard was higher than that because yeah. money wasn't the definitive measure yeah. of artistic merit mm-hmm. in his eyes. And to me, that kind of really changed the way I perceive what I'm doing. Even right now, we have we have the Red Hood trailer out, mm-hmm. and I'm still trying to make sense out of the information, the data that's coming back. Yeah. Um, the the we're watching it closely, clearly. Yeah. Because uh, we, you know, we're trying to figure out what the next step for us is, and. The like and dislike ratio was amazing. I think mm-hmm. it's like 1.3 uh, or 1,300 likes to 19 dislikes. Wow. Yeah. And I think it's close to overall on all the platforms, it's a, like close to 70,000 views in yeah. three days. Yeah. <clears throat> and we were lucky enough to have Robot Underdog mm-hmm, right. like release it for us. And, but yet there's this thing of what could I have done better? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The perfectionist is kicking in. Yeah. After the fact, you're like, oh man. Well, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's really that's I'm that's super fascinating because I always love asking all my friends like their thoughts on film school because like it really is it really depends because there are so many variables. Mm -hmm. Like you, like I didn't really have that kind of father figure to be like. Mm 
hey, yo, that sucked. Do it. Like, figure, <laughs> figure out how to do it. You know? So, like, me, for someone like me, I definitely needed that structure. And I, I needed... Um, for me, like I'm, I'm, I'm such an introvert. Like I grew up like as an only child, and like I was such an introvert. And like for me, like I, it is really hard for me to network. Um, so being forced to be surrounded by you know those other film mm-hmm. creators just kind of really helped me. And I just I know for a fact I couldn't do it myself. So I'm I'm really grateful. And like the the information that I took away from it, and w- one of my my cinematography mentor. Um, I thanked him when I was uh, graduating he, and I was like, thanks, thanks for everything you've done. And I was like, and then he said to me, he was like, you got the same information everyone else did. It's just what you did with it. And I was mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. Yeah. You, uh, see, he took it a step further though, mm-hmm. because I mean, like I was thinking about it. My, my dad actually just passed in December. And one thing that never hit me harder than that was like, wow, like, the title wasn't just a title. He actually was a master of something and I was Mm. around him all the time and he would flaunt it. Like I remember when I first, when we first, when I first started showing signs that I had maybe a little bit of the eye in terms of cinematography and light, he was like, Oh, you think you're something. Okay. Let's go take a picture of an apple. You can take, let's say what hour and a half good enough for you. And I'd be like, yeah. And he'd be like, and I'll take 10 minutes and I'll take a better picture than you. (laughs) <laughs> and it just stirred something in me that was like, no, you're not. And I would, I would take <laughs> like 16 lights yeah. and every diffusion tool in the house <laughs> and like light this apple and take what I thought was the most amazing picture. And he would call time. That's it. And he'd come in and he so would guys actually did this. Yeah, yeah. And he would be like, uh, I only got 10 minutes, clean up your mess and I'll come back and I'll take a picture. And I'd strip it down and he'd be like, now get out of here. And I would try and watch and see what he was doing. And he'd be like, get out of here. And then I would come back and like magic, there would be like one picture on the screen. I took <laughs> thousands of pictures, by the way. <laughs> he would have one picture. Wow. And it was like, how did you do that? And he'd be like, this is where you put the lights, not how many you have, mm-hmm. not what you put in between them first and foremost. Yeah. You know, so there was the word challenge. He lit that fire under yeah. your ass. To the awesome. point where you do it to yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, right. what can I do better? What can I do next? Yeah. Uh, and that's how I feel that yeah. my mentor, mm-hmm. you know, that's what he gave to me. It's mm-hmm. like, well, all right, how do I do? Like, basically, whenever I go on set, I'm like, what would he do? And then that's mm-hmm. just kind of instilled that thought process in me. All right, how do I do this better? You know, and that's but, amazing. But the that. school thing, I think it's more about figuring out how you learn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, absolutely. there's so many different learning styles. and Yeah, whatever mm-hmm. works for you. Like, right. everyone's journey is different. Whatever path they take is different. I mean, if that works for you, I mean, by all means... Mm-hmm. I don't want to be in someone to be like, don't go to school or, yeah. you know what I mean? It just like, takes a real self-evaluation exactly. of where you are and what kind of person, like how you learn. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so with you guys being kind of primarily self-taught, if, if that's safe for me to say, mm-hmm. yeah. um, what sort, what sort, what kind of resources do you take advantage of now to help further you learn your craft? YouTube. YouTube. <laughs> so <Okay>. much YouTube. <laughs> what about you, Sonny? Practical application. Mm-hmm. I like, I fail. Oh, I yeah. fail a ton in private, so I don't fail as much in public. In public, yeah. Wow. I feel that's the best way to learn something is to mess it up because then yep. you just, like, I feel, I sit there and I feel it and I just feel terrible. And I'm like, I don't ever want to feel that way again. Mm. So I go out of my way to just make sure that I don't make that mistake yeah. again. That's all about growth, too. It's like, that's how we learn. It's like, damn, I made this huge mistake on set. Exactly. I'm never going to do that again. Mm-hmm. You know, it's crazy. Um, so uh, you, you mentioned YouTube. Um, what are, like... There is so much stuff on YouTube. Oh, yeah. There is so much stuff. How do you go about discerning the good information from bad information? Um, It's tough. I mean, because there is just so many. And it's like, a, I mean, you go down one rabbit hole and 10 hours later, you're somewhere else. And I'm like, wait, I came cat here. Videos. Yeah, and no. I'm just like, <laughs> I came here to watch a video on this new light product that just came out. Or, mm-hmm. um, Honestly, I try to be as specific as possible. Um, if I'm trying to learn a very specific aspect or very specific tool, um, usually what I try to do is I'll try to learn more about a tool that I have or that I, I have my eye on mm-hmm. and I just start looking at it that way. And even if I don't own it yet, I want to know it. So when I do own it or when I do get my hands on it, I'm not sitting there twiddling my thumbs going, uh, can someone help me out with this? Yeah, you know? Yeah. So to me, it just goes with that. And, you know, again, like obviously if you see someone that has like a lot more views, a lot more subscribers, you in my brain, I'm going, Hey, this guy seems official, but you know, it, it's, it's yeah. all what works for you. Like yeah. some people 
click with me. Some people don't. And again, like Hassani was saying, application, because then I'll sit there in my living room, build my camera, and I'm like, okay, this didn't work. And so what do I need to do that? What did he do that I didn't do? So Mm -hmm. I think for me, a lot of times what I'll do is is I'll just examine their work. If I like their work, then, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll I'll take, I'll take what they say with a grain of salt, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes like I'll just, Sometimes people, I feel, I feel like people like they're like the self-proclaimed like mm-hmm. masterful, oh, yeah. you know, like oh, oh yeah. I have all these subscribers. It like it's like it almost. I feel like sometimes, not always, but sometimes it gets in people's heads and like, yeah. and then they just spew out. It's just at that point, obviously they're making revenue off of the views that they're getting. So obviously that's a factor. Like there's so many variables and like, like I, I there's this one video I saw. It's like take your footage and make it transform it from this. To this and like the mm-hmm. ending, this was like look like crap. Yeah. I, was like, <laughs> I was like, who I'm, would want? No, nah, I'm good, bro. <laughs> I was, but yeah, like so many views, and I'm like, and then like the comments are like, wow, this is wrong. It's like, well, it's like, all right, well, if it does that for you, then you know, by all means, go well, ahead. Well, I mean, there's another thing too. Like once again, like all of this stuff is so complimentary. Like you you segue beautifully from like how do you learn basically mm-hmm. to like what do you use to learn. Yeah. And like, I'm going to take it a step further and say, what's the motivation of the teacher? Like mm. you, like you, you yeah. were hitting on it right there. It's yeah. subscribers and like, yeah, I yeah. love Matt Workman, but his, his app, his, his, his program mm. is his primary He's focus in teaching you how to use that. Yeah. And like Pre-vis, he teaches yeah. mm-hmm. from a, from a perspective of here's where you put all your lights. And like Bruce Lee is amazing. Our art is not as rigid as anyone makes it seem. Like learning should come as, as artists, I believe learning should come from not like, Oh, this dropped in my lap. Therefore I should do it this way. It, you should have an immediate need, a need to learn how to shape this light this way. And you don't understand how. And most of the time, just about anybody can be a good teacher when you have a very specific need. Like he said, I, if I want to know how this tool works, mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to go search that out and you'll learn if that tool is capable of helping you in this manner or not based on that person's experience. Oftentimes I resort, still resort to like, I don't really give a shit what they say. Can I say shit? I can say shit, right? Say whatever you want. I don't give a shit what they say. I want to do it myself because what if they're doing it wrong or what if if they haven't used it right? They're not using it to its full potential. And I see that so many times and I'm like, what if? What if they're in with the person who's giving it to them? Right, you know what yeah, I mean? Right. Like, so, there's, like so I said, there's so many variables. Yep. YouTube used to be a much more pure place. People had to come from the heart, but now it feels like uh, it's a very, it's a very like you you can see that people have like a very clear motivation. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. some people like go to YouTube for entertainment first, and if you pick up something great, go to YouTube if you have a very specific question, right? Yeah, that's like, usually, yeah. Usually when I'm on there looking for something, it is very specific. Yeah. Man, but learning should come from, like, that's what, I'm going to take it back to college. That's why I don't like college. <laughs> I went to college not knowing what the hell I wanted to learn about anything mm-hmm. and barely learned anything because it wasn't of interest. But today, if I have a problem with any piece of sound equipment or lighting equipment or a program, I will find something mm-hmm. or I will create an answer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh I think younger people need to like really kind of yeah. come at it from that perspective. Yeah. And like I the one of the that's kind of one of my motivations is kind of pursuing the YouTube game is just cuz was basically from seeing all this just mm-hmm. information that I think in my opinion is just garbage. Mm-hmm. So like not to say that oh whatever I say is right, you know, it's 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 obviously very subjective. Obviously all those variables come in, but you know I want to come, there are, there are a lot of things I really took away from film school and there are things that I absolutely did not get from film Mm -hmm, school. mm -hmm. And a lot of people just aren't talking about those, like those specific subjects. And like, there's so like the business aspect, how do you Mm -hmm. do your taxes? Like, ain't nobody talking about taxes on film school. It's like, and like, how do you navigate that? And how do you set your prices? Yeah. How do you Uh, negotiate your rates? rates? Yeah, exactly. There's so many, there's, there's just this whole cloud of stuff I did not learn from film school and it's, um, you know, I learn more from you guys. 
Yeah, like, like, on, like working it, with, yep. exactly. Yeah, yeah, onset peers, experience is, exactly. is, is one I of the I mean, things. experience is the best experience. Yep. So, mm-hmm. so if you aren't doing learn. anything, whether you're paid or not, you're probably not going to learn much. Exactly. You're mm-hmm. going to get stagnant. You're just going to sit there and not grow. And mm-hmm. so, mm-hmm. Sorry about that. All right. Yeah, Segway. no, no, that's all Segway. good. Segue <laughs> into my next question is, have there ever been any times where you've been on set and you felt like you can't like hang with like the crew? Like, I don't know, f- sometimes for me, I, f- I feel like I'm on set. I, don't, I feel like I'm like just on a totally different like level <laughs> than everyone else. And I'm like, well, what the heck am I doing here? Like almost like an imposter syndrome kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it happens once in a while. Usually like when I arrive to a set and I see how like sometimes if it's a really big set and they have all the trucks and everyone, yeah. you know, you got, like, like, uh, you got a 20, 30 person crew. I was like, holy crap, what did I just walk into? Yeah. But, you know, within the first 30 minutes or whatever, I'm like, oh, no, I belong here. You kind of acclimate. Yeah. You know, yeah, you acclimate. You're just like, oh, it's just it's just you know, adjusting to their workflow, you mm-hmm. know, because at the end of the day, like, you know, you have to believe in yourself and know that, hey, I'm here for a reason. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I wouldn't have gotten this job if I if I didn't know what I was doing in some way or capacity, even if, you know, even though you kind of pad your your stats a little bit here and there. But, you know, you got to at the end of the day, you got to just believe in yourself and go for it. I agree with that answer. A hundred percent. If I had anything to add to it. Uh, I think I worry about things the day before. And maybe the car ride there. And then when I get to set, I'm not even, it, there feels like there's a part of me that's not even in my body anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, that's the best part about filmmaking is it is a, for me, it's more of an out of, it is an out of body experience. I don't know how I know half the shit I know most of the time. I absorbed information from my dad watching him do stuff. I'm sure I can resort to stuff. I saw even my peers do before and I'm like, Oh, Oh, yeah. I know how to fix yeah, that yeah. stuff. Yep. Yeah. Like I've seen this solved before. Yep. Mm-hmm. And um, but it's not like something I'm consciously like problem solving. It's just like epiphany after epiphany after epiphany. So uh, I don't really worry about my capability to hang sometimes. And even when I'm in my car or the day before, I'm not even worried about the actual task. I'm more worried about the people, the type of per- personalities I'm going to run into, because you can run into a personality that is impossible for you to navigate. Mm. And therefore, you might not. If they're, your, if they're your superior or even if they're working with you. It's almost a skill set in itself. Just being dealing able, with people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Navigating relationships. Yeah. It's a huge asset mm-hmm. just for you yourself to have. Like ego. In the ego. Oh, like if you get that person huge. who can't listen or doesn't respect you or didn't want you on the job because they wanted their friend but XYZ. he wasn't available yep, yep, or they yep. didn't want to hire him. Like how do you not? Na- that's the situations I worry about because everything else – we're in it together. I don't have to have all the answers, mm-hmm. you know. But when you got that situation, mm-hmm. someone kind of like really wanting you to fail or like against you in a way, like that's when it gets tough. You know, it's, it's interesting because like a lot of my work is like the kind of one man band type stuff. Um, and it's interesting because I feel like whenever I get onto actual like big sets, like 20, uh, crew 20, 30, I feel like sometimes, because a lot of times I'll, I'll go onto those sets as like an AC mm-hmm. f- for the most part. And I honestly just haven't really done, I don't have a lot of AC experience. So I feel like when I get <laughs> yeah. on set, I'm like, uh, I, I like almost have a panic attack. And it's like everything is kind of so fast paced and like the expectation is so high. And I'm just like kind of freaking out inside and it's weird because i feel like my connotation of the one-man band is kind of changing because like when i think of real productions i think of like big Mm -hmm. big crews and like when i think now i'm starting to think when i think of one-man band i think of like the typical general videographer you know Mm -hmm. sets Mm -hmm. up a couple lights you know very kind of generic and like i i don't know i feel like my connotation of that word is kind of changing Mm -hmm. um and i you know Again, I, I try not to do this, but I do it anyway. I like whenever I'm on the gram, you know, looking at other people's stories, I always see all my film school friends are oh mm. they're crushing it on set, mm, yeah. always on set. Meanwhile, I'm like, you know, twiddling my thumbs at home <laughs> in bed. Like, but you know, at the same time, it's like I feel like the internet, it like puts this pressure on you, you know, and it like it's almost like you put this pressure on yourself, um, because the internet is such like. Mm-hmm. You see so much stuff on the internet and it's like, Absolutely. all right, well, crap, what am I doing with my life? It's like, you know, at the same time, you just kind of got to worry about yourself. So, yeah, I don't fit that. I don't fit that mode. <laughs> <That's not me. laughs> like, it sounds weird. Like, cause I, I, I like seeing like when you're killing it, it's inspiring to me for one thing, Yeah, but it's not my thing. Yeah, Like I, I, Bert knows I'm notorious for like, <laughs> I like working for myself Yeah, yeah. And, absolutely. and like I work enough gigs to more or less 
do my own thing. Yeah. And yeah. like, I only work those gigs for people I really respect and really like, like, I don't know how I get away with working jobs. I don't know how I make a living only working the stuff that I love. I don't know how that works because it seems like it's a really tough thing for almost everybody else. And the pressure, the financial strain does become kind of weird at times and it messes with my head. Absolutely. But nah, man, I, for the most part, I, 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 I pull off doing my own thing. And I yeah. feel like that, for me, it's worked the opposite way. Like being a, a, a filmmaker, a one-man band sort of a dude, it has made me more valuable because I can be plugged in just about anywhere. Yeah. And when I'm on those big sets, it's way less pressure than when I'm on my own. Because when I'm on my own set, if somebody doesn't show up on time, it's probably my fault. Mm -hmm. yeah. But And then you got to exactly. pick up cover yeah, for it. I'm an AD. I'm a director. I'm yeah. the writer. If, if somebody doesn't know their lines and continuity and paying attention, I'm supposed to know what I wrote. Yeah. You know, like it. But if I'm working on a car commercial for a friend and I'm cam mm -hmm. opping or doing gimbal work or anything where like they, you know what I mean? That's every my one position thing. Is, is specialized and you Those only have to worry about the easiest yeah, jobs absolutely. because I feel like I'm insignificant. I'm a cog. I'm not the, I'm not the job. I'm a part of it. And, and it feels, I used to get a little worried when I was like You're 19, cog, 20. Yeah. Like right. I'm a cog, not the, mm -hmm. like my, like my dad used to have me do stuff and I used to get so nervous because I didn't want to embarrass him and stuff. Yeah. But the truth is, most of those days I walked away with people being like, you did such a good job. And I'd be like, I didn't even know you knew I was here. Really? <laughs> and and on, even on the jobs today where like I'll do like I'll do like I do a lot of niche work where I'll do camera opping yeah. in situations where no one else wants to do it. So I get paid really well. Like the like we're going to build a wall around you, Hassani, and you're going to shoot through this little tiny hole on this surprise thing. And it's going to get really hot and it's going to suck and no one else wants to do it. Will you do it? And I'll be like, hell yeah, it's a challenge. I'll do that <laughs> That's shit. me. And like, sometimes stuff will get dicey in those situations. You can't move. You can't breathe. You start to freak out. And I just say nothing. And nine times out of 10, the director was like, you crushed it on that take. And I was like, I fell asleep. for half. <laughs> <laughs> like, I swear to God, I fell asleep for half a take in a commercial. And that's the take that ended up in the oh, commercial. Oh, man. God. I was awesome. like, I was passing out. It was too hot. And like my equipment was failing. It was so hot in there. Wow. So like, uh, but I think we, we fear failure so much that even if we didn't fail, sometimes we can make it real. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, like, uh, cause I should have, the time I was like passing out, I should have failed. But yet they were complimenting me when I got out of <laughs> That's there. That's amazing. All I had to do was not say shit. That's amazing. Yep. Um, yeah, you know, kind of doubling back to that kind of one man band space, you know, like kind of living in your own world. Um, for me, like I think about like, oh man, all my friends are doing all this cool stuff. And then I think about to what I'm doing. I'm like, well, dude, it's like, I have complete freedom. It's like, there's nothing more, you know, going back to having summers as a kid. It's like, mm -hmm. I have complete freedom to do whatever I want. And, you know, I don't have a part-time position with this production house where I have to show up and AC for this thing I really don't want to do. It's like, I can just say no, like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's kind of really wild. Um, so I want to kind of get into being an owner operator. Um, you guys are both kind of owner operators, uh, yeah. meaning that you own your own gear and as well as operating that gear, uh, when hired as opposed to like renting out. Um, so kind of getting into the gear, what kind of decision, like what kind of, what's your thought, pro what are your guys' thought process on deciding to pull a trigger on any specific piece of kit or gear? Um, well, for me personally, I didn't get into this to make someone else's project or to make their commercial. I, I got into this because I wanted to tell my own stories. I wanted to make my own films. He's stealing my answer. So Dang it. <laughs> that's why, that's why I slid in first. Cause I was like, Oh no, 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 I gotta do, you know, but, um, honestly at the end of the day, it comes down to, I mean, yeah, I, I do some freelance work here and there because I got to pay the bills, but yeah. Even those decisions are, I'm going to work this job and I'm going to turn this into something so I can make the project I want to make. And just being an owner operator gives me that power to do what I, yeah, for the most part, what freedom. I want to do. Yeah, it gives you the freedom and the power to say, you know what, I'm not doing anything today. I'm going to go shoot a short film just because I can. And yeah. I go do that. And having that, you know, having that restraint lift off of you is just so freeing. So that's why I go into it. Yeah, a lot it. of times like you can help people. Yeah, like uh, I've, I've helped my friends. Like that Cinefems thing we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. the, the Catharsis short film, like 
we just did that because we thought it was cool, and we luckily had I luckily had all my own gear, so we didn't have to rent out. Mm-hmm. And it was free. Oh yeah, basically. and especially yeah, like you said, like with friends who need something, you know, you get hit up like, hey, I need this, and it's like you know, what? especially if they're your friends, like why not? Yeah, you know, I'm not like, doing anything. Today. Yeah, just let them borrow it, or you know, even like, hey, I can come out and help you guys out. You yeah. don't have to, you know. So it's it's great. Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, I think something Bert and I toss around, and I don't know where the phrase came from, but I've been saying it for a while too, is uh, working at the speed of thought. Hmm. like renting and having to problem solve how you're going to get the funds to rent, how you're going to transport things. Uh, by the time you get that done, sometimes you can lose enthusiasm for the project you were, Absolutely. you came up with. Um, so like, that's my biggest fear as like an owner operator. Sometimes I want to make stuff when I want to make it. Yep. And I don't want anybody to stop me or nothing to stop me. Even if it turns out like shit, at least I made it and mm-hmm. I did it when I wanted to. That's really, really important to me. Um, and I have the same motivation as him. It's a, My cameras are for me. Like, they don't go out without me, mm-hmm. ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They go out with me, and you can rent them from me, but they, they're they not like, it's not about the money. Like, And that's a different motivation than a lot of owners, because yeah, they're doing absolutely. the calculations on how long it's going to take but, them to pay yeah, it Yeah, sometimes off. people, uh, like uh, one filmmaker, Evan Boyster, mm-hmm. like, he partnered up with... Uh, one of his friends, and they made a very calculated decision to buy an Amira. Um, and I mean, sometimes you just have to come at, come at it from a business perspective. Like, mm-hmm. I think they put in um, thirty or so thousand dollars total, or a little bit over thirty thousand uh, dollars to buy this Amira package. And in less than a year, it's already doubled their investment. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it really just depends. But like, nice. you know, I, I totally get it. Where it's like, you know, I don't want to send my camera package out, you know, mm-hmm. without me because yeah. you know, there's no way. Yeah, there's, yeah. Th- I mean. It, it, it there's a chance it may not be ready when I want to use it. Right. Yeah. When that right. million dollar idea hits me, it may not be available. When my friend gets funding and wants to hire me to shoot their film, if my stuff is broken, I'm no good. Or if it's rented or if out, it's I'm out, no good. I'm or like, if the well, sensor gets scratched and I didn't notice it. Yeah. Notice it. Those are the sort of things that... So, But don't get me wrong. Like I don't knock those guys. Those oh, guys yeah. are every bit as dope. As, as we are for yeah. making that decision. It's hard to be an owner op. I spend three to $6,000 a year on repairs on all the equipment mm. I have. It takes a hell of Just a Just even maintenance. Yeah. 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 Like the patience, the monk-like patience it takes to see your equipment broken on set and not react. Oh, my God. Like yeah. people can say whatever they want about me. But like Bert walked up to me with pieces of my light once, and I don't think I reacted. I just stood there. But yeah. on the inside, I was like, I just got the. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so, like just went yeah, off. So on the outside, bad. like yeah, like so. There's you know, and uh, and yes, I, I have a girlfriend of twelve years now, almost twelve years. Wow, nice. she's been there through every purchase, and the the thing that never goes away as an owner operator is hearing, you don't even use it as much as you should. <laughs> You're never getting rid of that. My girlfriend says, oh, yeah. no. what do you need yeah. that for? What do you need yeah. that for? You're never getting rid of that. She's, no one is She'll probably to listen to this and start laughing. But uh, she said, literally everything I buy, she's like, what do you need that for? You exactly. don't need that. Exactly. And I'm like, you don't need it until you need it. Yep. And like, 2017 was a dope year. 2018 so far too, yeah. because I've been using stuff that's just been sitting around and going, "Aha! Mm-hmm. I knew it. Yeah. I knew I, I was going to need it." Yeah. Yeah. Dude, me too. That <laughs> happens to me all the time. Like I'll, I like I'll, I'll upgrade. I'll like, t- I'll, adj- I'll make some adjustments to my rig, and I'm like, "Dude, what? I need this X Y Z," and I'll just like pull open a drawer. Mm-hmm. It's out there. Um, don't, don't touch that dial. I want to. I want to go deeper. Okay. You want to go deeper with Uh-oh. me? It yeah. sounds weird. Let's. That was weird phrasing. <laughs> Let's take Let's a go dive. <laughs> Let's take a dive. Um, think about it like this. Like, for me, I don't see owning people. You know these categories, man. I do what I have to do to make films. Like people have been trying to put me. I've gotten into intense arguments with like older gentlemen who insist I have to pick what I do and pick what people call me, or I'm going to be nothing. And to me. Everything is complimentary. So if you don't know, if you just block off wanting to know anything about a certain aspect of a production, you're making yourself worse. Mm -hmm. Like we just shot that trailer for Red Hood. We spent two days doing set design. Yep. One day shooting. Wow. Because as you know, as a cinematographer, it doesn't matter how good you light stuff and what sort of lens you got. If 
the wall looks like shit. It looks like shit. Yeah, yeah if it looks like, yeah. Yeah, if the person in front well, of the so camera did, is ugly. Where, yeah. Where'd you shoot it? Where was that? In the garage. Yeah. See? One car garage. That's yep. amazing. One like, car garage. We were right there. Yep. Could barely move, but we made it work. And like, that's the one thing I, I especially notice on a lot of, it's like, uh, I'll get people's cards that, oh, my filmmaker, so I'll like look at their stuff. And, you know, it's, you know obviously low, but we've all been mm-hmm. there where it's like they shoot a short film in like an apartment and mm-hmm. like, you know, blank white walls and yep. it's just like you can't yep. make the, yeah. it's like you can just tell it's like i yep. can tell like you live screams low budget yeah yep. but if you know like you get better at these uh peripheral things that makes you seem like a stronger cinematographer even mm-hmm. though you weren't touching a lens you weren't touching a camera you were just teaching yourself what colors look great in the background yeah. what textures look great in the background how to how to create patterns with unorthodox items you step your game up from all angles. You know, a fighter doesn't go. I'm only gonna. I'm only uh, 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 gonna throw punches with my right hand. Yeah. He works his footwork. He works his cardio. Mm-hmm. All encompassing. Filmmaker, yep. like for example, I don't see owning a camera as any different than owning a laptop because, in all likelihood, being a writer has made me more money than and my camera ever has. And my cameras have paid for themselves many times over already. Mm-hmm. And it's so like, ultimately, the best part about what we do is as long as you have a laptop or a pen and piece of paper or any camera, cell phone camera, you run the risk of being able to change your life, like with that one tool, mm-hmm. yep. you know, and, and don't get me wrong, like the better the camera, I see it this way. I own a Ari Alexa because the people I'm showing my projects to may not have the imagination to see what I'm trying to do or the, they may not have the imagination to understand what I'm trying to communicate unless I do it in a grand fashion. That's it. That's it. That's what we're all doing. Mm-hmm. We're trying yeah. to sell an illusion as best as possible when these cameras help us do it. Yeah. So as long as I have my camera, I can do pitch videos. I can do trailers for projects I'm trying to get funding for. Like you can't really even put a worth on that because let one of them take off. Let one of them get bought by someone or optioned. I mean, I optioned a, a TV pilot and made $25,000 of something I sat in this chair yeah. and wrote in my bedroom. That's amazing. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it's like I, the power of these tools have, like, yeah. are astronomical. Yep. Go and out. it's just what yeah. you do with them, you exactly. know? Exactly. So like, you know, having, having a camera is just complimentary to being a writer to yeah. some people. Some people would say, or complimentary to being a director or an editor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Anywho. Sorry, guys. That's deep. Tangent. Oh, yeah, That's that was insightful. Good. No, I love that. Um, so you also, in, in addition to your kid, Asani, you own kind of a non-standard mix of Zine, Schneider, and uh, uh, Zeiss Cine lenses. <laughs> Calling me out, huh? <laughs> yeah. so, so tell me about that. Uh, I guess I'm I'm coming across as like a total rebel of the game and doing whatever <laughs> no, the hell I want. No, that's all good. Um, I, I love my films looking different. I have an Ari Alexa with a Canon mount on it because... That's I, what I'm planning on. on yeah, in, like, in the, in the you know, future, yeah. but like that, that uh, Ari classic... I have an Ari Alexa M actually, which is even more unusual. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love throwing. My first project was a boxing project called Fight Night. And I shot it with Zeiss CY photo lenses. It's one of the more beautiful films I've ever made. Like, so why would I want to rule out those lenses just because I moved to a better sensor? Um, also, so I've kind of been streamlining everything toward Canon, and yeah, I'm excited to do some anamorphic stuff at some point, but I'm actually kind of counting down the days before those options. I mean, there already are. Atlas, they're already throwing, yeah, you know, making Canon mount anamorphic lenses, and that's really where, like, Cook Cook tried already. They're still having problems with the flange distance, but yep. it's going to happen eventually. I'm not going to need a PL mount to use classically beautiful lenses so do you would you say that you have a preference for a canon ef mount yeah i just it's just a workflow thing working at the Mm -hmm. speed of thought maximizing money i've already spent yeah especially Um, like using time as a resource as well what about you bro do you have a preference for Uh, lens mounts yeah no definitely i've definitely leaned ef um a lot of the cameras i use come up are ef you know the dslr is obviously um my black magic's ef so when i got my alexa i made sure you know ef mount and me and Hassani are shooting our films together and we're cross coveraging. So we want to make sure that our looks match. So, uh, you know, for the most part, I'm trying to piece my kit a little more. So it matches a little more mm-hmm. so we can mix and match and be more seamless. Yeah. And, and, and matching is, I mean, look, 
can I fool you 100% of the time with what, what lenses I'm using? No, you would be able to tell. But the average person won't. No. As long as I always shoot my close-ups with the 135 and I shoot my wides with the 24 on the zine, mm-hmm. as long as all my wides those match ends, my yeah. other wides, mm-hmm. I'm good to go. That's interesting, yeah. That's as long really cool. as my mids are on my Zeiss 55 yep. and those feel the same. And color, sci- color science is moving to the point where it's barely going to matter what to the average person it's barely going to matter what 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 camera we're using cuz you're going to be able to push the colors to where they need to be yeah. absolutely yeah so I don't really worry about it i think we obsess over it a little too much mm-hmm. i just i like what i like i like the effect it gives me and very rarely do people tell me my cinematography looks like shit but i'm breaking all sorts yeah. of rules yeah, yeah. they're not yeah Exactly. Um, yeah, I was really interested in hearing what your guys' preferences are on lens mounts because, like, me, in the next couple of years, I'm probably going to upgrade my camera system, and I've always been bouncing back and forth between PL and EF. Like, I do, like, I'm right now I'm probably leaning towards EF just because all of my lenses right now, like, I want to be able to use my lighter DSLR lenses on yeah. that thing. Mm-hmm. And um, I do love the PL mount, but, um, and I love how secure it is. Like I do have some problems sometimes with EF and how, just how, how it locks, um, mm-hmm. like the PL is so solid. So yeah, I just want to get your guys' uh, input on that. Um, so Bert, you, I think I did some digging. You, I think, did you Uh-oh. start on the, the original Ursa? Is that what, oh, is yeah, that what yeah. I saw? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day. Uh, yeah. That was when I really started getting into cinematography. Um, that was kind of where, yeah, that's kind of where I really learned a lot. The <laughs> Yeah, they a lot of broken promises on that camera. Yeah. I was very disappointed. <laughs> I hear you. Um, no, that, that was actually one of the first camera systems I looked into, the Ursa, and then they announced the Ursa Mini, and then I was like, yeah. oh, man, this looks dope. And that was actually the main camera I was I had pulled I had set my eyes on before I decided eventually decided on the FS7. That's funny because the FS7, at, the, at that time I was looking at the FS7 and the, the Ursa, and it was just just out of price range. Like the, yeah. the FS7 was just a little too much, and I just totally. I was like, you know what? I'm we were already putting everything into it, and I, so yeah, so we went with that option. And I mean, it was great. I mean, I definitely learned. It, it forced me to learn a lot faster because the sensor on it, it's okay, it's solid. It needs yeah. a lot of light. Yeah, you need to pump a lot of light into it, so it wasn't great for run and gun jobs. Sure. Um, you know, even like trying to do like a wedding with that thing was like one of the worst experiences. I've yeah, ever had. actually, that was another kind of one of my questions too, because you've ha- you've had some experience with weddings, correct? Yeah, yeah, I've I've did a, I mean, yeah, I've pretty much done almost everything at this point. Yeah. So, uh, how, what are your thoughts, or how do you feel towards weddings? I'm interested. Um, honestly, the reason why I did a lot of those weddings were friends needed someone to shoot something sure. to cover for their business, and that's why I did it. I did not go out there looking to shoot weddings. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was all friends businesses. One of my buddies, he runs a DJ business and he offers video. So he just says, Hey, I need a cinematographer for a wedding. Can you come and shoot this? I'm like, sure. I got your back, bro. So nice. That's pretty much the extent of how and why I would shoot a wedding. Do you, okay. So let me ask you this. Do you like shooting weddings? (laughs) At first I did. And after, after like 20 or so weddings, I just kind of got over it, Dude, if I'm being totally honest. Same. I, I'm a little bit jaded from weddings now. Dude, they're all the same. Yeah, it's the your same Your weddings thing. are amazing, though. Like, your stuff looks <laughs> incredible. You're so tactical about how you pack and the gear you take. Mm-hmm. Jeez, man. Like, yeah. yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's hard because, you know, I... I'm a li- I got a little bit burnt out from weddings, so that's why I don't really try not to do any anymore unless the budget is there. If mm-hmm. the budget's there, I'm all in. Yeah. Um, and but it's like, I, but the thing is, I don't really get, especially in Vegas. Like Vegas, the Vegas wedding market is very kind of low cost, low budget. Yeah. So it's like I don't get too, I don't get barely, uh, if if any at my full rate. Um, yeah. So it's nice when I do have those clients that do kind of appreciate the value behind what, you know, I bring to the table in terms of equipment and skill, you know. So um, anyways, kind of rolling back onto the the, the, Ursa, the Ursa game, um, <laughs> I, yeah, so like you, t- you said, you mentioned that it was, the FS7 was just a little bit out of your budget. I think at that point, because what was that, 2015, 16? It was like, yeah, 2014, I think, with the oh, okay. original Ursa, yeah. And then, because you went to the the Ursa Mini, right? Yeah, well, and that was after like a year or two. I think I think it was like the following year they came out with the Ursa Mini. I did feel you like just up, did you just sell it and upgrade? No, it's still you... sitting in a box. It's <laughs> oh, sitting so in a you box. Have both? I still yeah, it's still there. Oh, you yeah, have both? It. What the heck? Um, 
<laughs> yeah, so it's just kind of <laughs> sitting there. I'm not going to lie. I was just talking about this the other night, and uh, I was like, you know what? Part of me wants to like shoot something on it again just to show them, like, hey, I, I, yeah. now that I'm better, now that I've learned just more. Just kind of flex your muscles sorry. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You're like, hey, you know, I can, I can, do, I can still work with this. But um, it was tough because, I mean, it was, a, it was a pretty big camera, pretty heavy. Um, Dude, I, had to get a whole a new, I had to get a whole new tripod, a whole new oh, battery yes. system. Because, like, when you come up from a 5D to that thing, you're like, yeah, oh, even tripods. Even like GH4 to FS7? Yeah, you're like, this yeah. doesn't work. <laughs> like, you know, and I just, I, I'm still convinced that somewhere in that camera, Blackmagic is just putting, like, little metal weights just in the camera for some reason. <laughs> just for I don't the know sake why. of it. Uh, just, just, to, just to troll you. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> like, once I, you know, once I got upgraded to my FS7, I had to rethink camera mm-hmm. support. 100 percent because yep. you cannot throw that thing on a, on a little man frodo like it's just not gonna just handle it and so you know that's why that's kind of where i started building my philosophy of just buying it once so like if yep. i get a piece of kit i i, I want to make sure that i'm getting like the absolutely best value for what i'm paying and if it's expensive then so be it i just want to make sure that i don't mm-hmm. have to spend that money again it's otherwise yeah, yeah. yeah if you if i if i spend something if i spend money now on something that's cheaper um, two years down the road, I'm going to have to upgrade it again. So Absolutely. might as well just get the top quality stuff now, like once, even though it is a little bit more expensive than, and just, you know, it's just biting the bullet. Absolutely. And like, I agree. That's kind of what I did with my FS seven too. Like I, I actually, I, I, I was all over the place. I went from Ursa mini. I was like, Oh man, I want the Ursa mini. And then I was like, well, I, you know, the C 100 Mark two, that, that one's really good. I really <laughs> yeah. like that one. Well, what about a C three C three hundred? I don't know. Or, or, never mind. FS five. I want the FS five. FS five is like. Mm-hmm. But then there were certain quirks that yeah, the FS seven yeah, yeah. FS five had that the FS seven solved. So I was like, all right, let me just wait a little bit longer, save mm-hmm. up a little bit extra, yep. and just get the. And I am so grateful I've done that because um, I I freaking love my my FS seven and mm-hmm. and I I do work with the FS five actually a, a lot now. And it is a great camera, but there are just these tiny little quirks that I'm just like, ugh, my FS7 doesn't do this. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of really grateful for that. Uh, so Hassani, mm. you own both a Red and Alexa kind mm-hmm. of camera systems. What led you to those purchasing decisions? Um, I was a Red guy. I mean, I, honestly, uh, once again, it was about pushing my ideas mm-hmm. so that people had to have a little less imagination to understand what I was trying to do. And at first, a red did that for me. Aries were like $120,000 oh, yeah. back in the day. And reds were new, untested stuff. So I ended up getting a red one. Uh, and then I got the red, uh, MX sensor. And I shot with that for a while. And um, the thing that made me move away from red is how many cameras they were cycling through so quickly. Like a ref- refreshing, yeah. you mean? Yeah, like it was yeah. and the whole like modular design and then abandoning the the epic body for like a new body for some reason even though they look damn near identical to me other than the mini mag and no one wants to talk about that Mm -hmm. but (laughs) what's the biggest factor i love my red epic the trailer for red i love it too yeah i know it's it's an incredible camera camera. still the high speed is incredible we're still going to probably shoot when we shoot our features we're going to end up using that almost exclusively on the gimbal because it's just yeah ready to go yep um, but what really moved me toward, toward the Ari was how much money I'd save on hard drive space, shooting my feature films and yeah. pilots. Does that do ProRes? Yep. Yes. And the yeah. ProRes has somehow damn near as much latitude or more than my Red Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's insane how much latitude yeah. the Alexas so, have. And, yep. and especially like if you, compared to like Red Coat, like dude, there's, mm-hmm. it's like no compare. And like, so I, I remember, I, I remember when I first learned that the Alexas do ProRes, I'm like, are mm-hmm. you freaking kidding it's me? It's so fast. All this, yeah. all like all the movies that I've mm-hmm. seen yep. are done Pro on Res. ProRes. Oh my gosh! So what? Uh, what flavor uh, ProRes do you usually shoot with? Uh, four 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 HQ, I believe is uh, okay. what it yeah. is. Um, we're shooting in that, and I love it. It's Dude, so easy it to edit. It's so easy to edit. My computer doesn't get bogged down. Edit exactly. Right. On, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so crazy. Should I tell them about Red Hood. The how the ProRes is such a. Um, user-friendly Kodak that I did all my visual effects in Premiere without my computer slowing down. Dang. All of the visual effects that you see in it were done in Premiere, except for like two shots that Danny uh, Shepard from Ismahawk helped out Mm -hmm. out with, which look amazing. But all of the muzzle flashes, all like simple stuff even where I'm like tracking, like literally I was just doing it by frame by frame and hiding little like 
parts oh, where people's pants yeah, went too yeah, far like and you could see their underwear or the down. mask yeah. came down so, or anything like that. I just hid that and it doesn't slow the computer down. But if you go, oh man, that trailer, which was shot at 5K, yeah. it, it slows down sometimes. It does, mm-hmm. like, yeah. you know, and, and I got a really beefy computer. I had, I had a custom one built from... Um, uh, HP workstations or something yeah. like that. Yeah, like it was a really, really nice. Com- it's a really, really nice computer, but damn, like, yeah, five- it, de- it definitely okay. helped. Like when we were yep. shooting on Red Hood, because there's a lot of sequences where we had both of our Alexas going, so we're doing mm-hmm. multicam. And I mean, just from a DIT standpoint and you know data management, we weren't burning through hard drive space with these cameras, mm-hmm. and it's amazing. It was just so it was just so wonderful. And then to turn around and make editing, you know. Straight to edit, smooth. it was amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it just was so smooth. Everything we did, computer wise, we didn't lose any performance. And I mean, it just it looks good, man. Yeah, <laughs> you throw a LUT on it, and you barely have to do anything else. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, that amazing. like the Alexa is a little bit more about speed. Yeah. For me, the Red is a little bit more about. I don't know. The Red is just a style choice right now. Stylistic choice. Yeah. yeah. Like if, if I like, I probably would exclusively do any like superhero or visual effects films with my red and any like real human stories and dramas anything where like people are definitely the priority i would shoot with the cool you just answered my next question that's (laughs) That's all good um yeah that's 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 incredible um so kind of wrapping up on this subject uh in terms of this year are there any like kind of big kind of goals slash purchases that you're planning on making uh, for me, n- I mean, honestly, not really getting that Alexa was kind of like, okay, I kind of don't want to buy anything else for a it's while. Like, okay, okay. I'm just like, mm-hmm. okay, you know, I got the ramen on standby. So <laughs> yeah, dude, I feel you. I feel you. But, um, I mean, the one thing that I'm always wanting, yeah, I'm definitely more interested in, in is lenses. So mm-hmm. I'm excited for NAB to check out what Ooh. new lens companies are coming out yes. just to see what's out there. So that's where my head's at. Um, I, we just... We went in on a set of a uh, circle dolly track. Oh yeah, a I saw, I've ago. been seeing that. We, yeah, yeah, we used fun. that for red. Did you get Hood. that from Jr.? No, no, we bought that. We bought it ourselves. Out of the country. Oh we wow. It, we bought the Chinese equivalent nice. of like Matthews essentially. That's awesome. Um, and uh, it's really great. Yeah. It was smooth. It was easy to put together. It was totally worth it. They're light. Yeah, they're very lightweight. Oh, really? um, yeah. We so that that was a big one. We bought some straight track to go with it. Um, I think the biggest thing I'm considering now is more filtration. I yeah. think I'm going to start becoming a little bit of a filtration snob <laughs> because truthfully, all of the stuff where I use heavy filtration is the best quality cinematography stuff I, I put out there. Mm-hmm. Like people really love the look. Like it, it's almost like from frame run, frame one, they're sold when I use filtration. We use filtration on the trailer for Red Hood, and that was oh, yeah. because we don't have enough filtration to do multiple cameras. We, you know, one would not match, so we need it. You know, we need to figure that out. He, unfortunately, he's going to have to spend a little bit more, more money on his feature so we can <sighs> get filtration <laughs> for both cameras. Yeah, sure. But uh, probably filtration is what's coming up next in terms of purchases. Uh, I'm trying yeah. to think. Is there anything else we're talking about? Maybe a couple more Quasars. Yeah, a couple more Quasars. Stupid they don't stuff. Hurt. Quasars stuff. don't hurt. Yeah, 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 yeah. More Quasars. it's always good yeah. to have a couple, couple yeah. more of those. Yeah, um, I, I, I was talking to you guys earlier. One of my big goals this year is to kind of invest in a set of solid Cine lenses. So... Again, like I'm excited for NAB to roll around so I can kind of get my hands on them. And, and um, um, so, yeah, that's kind of one of my big goals this year. I just kind of was curious if, as if you guys had any. So kind of moving on to Red Hood, it. Mm-hmm. Where did this idea come from? Um, I mean, we were talking, we were hanging out. We, we knew we wanted to do like a little test project because we got these features coming up. And honestly, we wanted to work out a lot of the bugs, like work out a lot of the kinks that could Almost come like into a, a test production. Run? Yeah, like a little That's test exactly run. What it was. And, you know, it originally was just going to be a little sequence and then it just spiraled into this whole film. We went and saw the new It that came out and literally walking to the car in the garage, he looks at me and goes, Bert, I'm like, yeah, what's up? Red Hood versus It. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm like, what? what? Oh, my <laughs> God. And then in the car, I'm sitting there like on the drive home, like, I'm just like, Oh, this is perfect. Oh my God, this is perfect. Like, all the dots started connecting. Everything made sense. It was beautiful. And I'm just like, no one has thought of this. This is going to be such an obscure, but really when you think about it and you see what we're doing with it, it's it's perfect. It's a match made in heaven. You know, it's just, and honestly, you know, I hope the fans like it because 
I see where the story can go. I, we've talked about where we kind of want to go with it, and I want to make more of it, but you know, it's kind of up to the fans if they want more. So mm-hmm. we'll see how it plays out. Um, so what were your guys' respective roles on the film? Uh, <laughs> like almost co everything at co- this point. Co- yeah, co bros. We co-bros. started co-bros. throwing, around, I like yep. started throwing yep. around the term co bros. I better yes. start. I better see that in the credits. Yeah, yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah we share yeah. a lot of responsibilities. Like the best thing about working with Bird is he is, although he has his focuses and and I think he's thinking like longevity wise, like because you can't do everything forever. Yeah. Like your body's gonna start sure. to wear down. You're gonna get tired. But we both do a little bit of everything, and having two people who can kind of like back each other up like that, you can divvy up so many tasks amongst yourselves. Yeah, makes the easy workload easier yeah. and, and yeah. And, and there's an overlap. You know that like he knows that if he's doing something and it's not quite kosher or he's, you know, it's dangerous or, or it could be better. I'll add in my two cents and vice versa. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Add, yeah. It's kind yeah of I cool mean, support system. Yeah. I mean, it was great. Like on Red Hood, you know, we both co-directed, co-produced, co-cinematography i mean there are days where we would tag out i uh, would be shooting mm-hmm. a shot and i was having some difficulty with it and he's like hey i think i can get it we literally like tagged out tag I, team i hopped on sound he got a couple shots and then there was an entire like action sequence we were shooting you know just to prevent fatigue mm-hmm. i would shoot like two or three takes and then he'd be like all right tag out and go and then he would go and shoot two three takes tag me back in and we just kept each other that way like it helped prevent anybody like either one of us getting mm-hmm. burned out on set which is great because so much of the responsibility falls solely on the two of us which honestly yeah. you know i wouldn't want to have it any other way <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so awesome. it worked out we should that was actually our only regret is like we probably could have we could have condensed things more and put more responsibility on ourselves. Because hmm. with the trailer, we did we did that by ourselves. It's it was just, just him us, and yeah. I and, and Jeff. Our oh yeah, set and our designer. set designer Jeff. And um, and of course Noel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. <laughs> but uh, like we kind of had it ready so that like that was so important. Like being able to have set ready so that when your actor comes, he can just do his thing and have a good time and then go home. Mm-hmm. You know, like instead of having to set everything. And yeah. So it sounds like you guys were pretty nature. bare bones crew. Was, some days some days it was and some days we had you know a decent sized crew and you know that's i think that's what he means when we look back on it you know there's a couple people that you know yeah they're just hanging out and they're there to have a good time and you know did we really need to have them on set they could have been doing something better with their time instead of just being a slate you know just uh, again <laughs> working out the kinks for the feature yeah. yeah like we realized we need our here and this is applicable for most filmmakers probably you pretty soon because you're obviously into doing passion stuff Mm -hmm. which means a film is probably coming next. Mm -hmm. It seems like our biggest fear when taking on bigger projects is entrusting ourselves with, you know what I mean? With all the responsibilities. Like, cause if you were to go out and shoot like a little film for fun, you would just do whatever you needed to, to get the film done. And you wouldn't think about it, but then you start getting all these people involved and you got to send out call sheets and all of a sudden Mm -hmm. I need help with everything. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with trusting yourself the same way with a bigger project than, than you do with your, you know, your passion ones, the ones you do on your own. F- finances are not because what got you there was what you was trusting yourself and 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 being the, per- the, the first person to put your hands on something and the last person to put your hands on something. You knew it was done right when you left whatever task that was. Mm-hmm. There's there's something to be said for that, you know. I used to throw out this thing where I'd say, uh, I was a Craigslist warrior for a while. I lived off <laughs> Craigslist uh, jobs I would get all the time. And there were there were a couple different types of shoot, but primarily there were two. Uh, there were filmmakers who wanted people to think they were making a big film and filmmakers that wanted to make a big film. The first, the people who wanted people to think they were making a big film, you know, so they look bigger than they yeah. are, would get the grip truck but have no idea how to use half the shit in it, mm-hmm. would have the generator but didn't need to light anything. You know what I mean? Like it was daytime. Kind of just exterior. flexing the muscles yep. just for the they sake of They would get flexing. trailers or, you know, a makeup artist yeah. when... It's like a status thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then there's the other guys who you get there and there's just the director and their buddy helping and then you, and you just get to fucking business. And like you make some of the most amazing things you've ever made before. And you're like, that person put every dime and every ounce of energy into what's on the screen. The other dude who wore his sunglasses to set and his, you know, his designer shirt 
you know, and had money to throw around, you know, he, I guess he got what he wanted out of it too. He, he got his Instagram photo and he got yeah. his, you know, you know, he, he looks like, life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag blessed. Hashtag um, movie man. Um, hashtag you know, on the hustle. Exactly. Yes. Like you have to decide what sort of filmmaker you want to be. Do you want to be the sort of filmmaker that makes big films or looks like he makes big films? And I have to gut check myself with that all the time. It's mm. like going yeah, to that's interesting. Yeah. the biggest project I'm ever going to do. Like, we got these features coming up and they mean the world to us. And we might, you know, I'm tired. I've made so many, so much stuff now that I, I'm always scared that I'm not going to have it in the tank to like push through yeah. as wow. like a one man or the one man band or doing 10 jobs on this one too. I yearn for the day where I don't have to. And the closest I've come is having this guy come around. Cause now it's just five That's jobs awesome. I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> so you so, yeah. you so you pretty much oversee the whole uh, process, uh, including the editing, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's the one thing that I kind of almost really have trouble with is whenever I do work with you know even if it's not like a big crew, if it's like if it's just for like a friend, I'm helping a friend do their short film and I'm handing stuff off to edit. You know, I you know I I'm really hesitant. I'm like, mm-hmm. it's like I I. You know, I almost get scared because like, um, you know, one, it's you got to color time it Two, You mm-hmm. have to just be a good editor. And it's like mm-hmm. there's so many variables that can go wrong, that can go south. Um, and I think that that's one thing that I'm kind of learning to kind of overcome now is just kind of trust mm-hmm. the crew. Let go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just kind of be able to let go. Sort of. It's tough. Yeah, yeah. To a point. We, yeah, uh, yeah. To be honest, I don't think we're at that point yet. I don't mm-hmm. think our projects are big enough to the point where you should sure. feel compelled to let go. Yeah. Um, Deacons has a lot to do with the coloring of the Absol- footage he yeah, shot. Absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. He's fact, there for the whole process. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So, like, why the fuck shouldn't you? Mm-hmm. Like, you shot it. You know how it's supposed to look. You know what you wanted it to mm-hmm. look like. You should be there for coloring. Yeah. And once again, it takes you back. And I'm sorry for talking so much, Bird. I'll shut okay. up. I, I promise. I'll I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, um, like, think about it. Complimentary skills. Like... You should know how to edit because you're not always going to be working with a veteran director. And you, as a cinematographer, I do see it within my responsibilities to watch his back. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yo, it's yep. like you got to learn. You got to know how to shoot yep. for the edit. You yep. know, this this may not cut like just because you have. As a cinematographer, when I am doing cinematography, I'm responsible for everything in the frame. Yeah. So if I see a continuity thing, I don't just cross my arms and go, that's her job or that's his <laughs> job. Like, that's fucking up my shot. That's yeah. your, this that's your responsibility. Yeah. yeah, like I'm in this. You know what I mean? This yeah. film needs to be as best as as it possibly can or we're screwed. So I, I make the call. And directors love that I do that because if it takes long enough, I realize somebody didn't notice it or something like that. I'm responsible for everything in the frame. When I'm shooting it and kind of when I'm not. The only thing I, that really falls where I'm secondary in terms of the responsibility is the performance and the actors. That's the director's sure, yeah. first yep. job. Yep. You see what I'm saying? Everything else, how they look, the shadows, mm-hmm. you know. I find myself doing yep. that a lot too with um, a lot of, uh, actually a lot of the recent shorts that I've done with, uh, you know, newer directors is that I'll kind of give hints or cues, be like, hey, maybe maybe they should hit it from, they, maybe they should come in this way, maybe blah, blah, X, Y, Z. Mm-hmm. Because one, um, it'll it'll just, cut, it'll cut better in the edit. And like, you know, me having edited all my own stuff up to this point, like I can tell, like I, I can visually see the sequence coming together and mm-hmm. like, Um, I think that thing, that is just a really important skill set to have too, is like being able to shoot for the edit, like knowing exactly Exactly. shooting for the edit. But you got to edit more. Exactly. That's one of the things that, I mean, same, same situation as you working with a lot of new directors, like shooting their projects. I always tell them like, you should be editing your first films Mm because you're going to learn so much about the way you approach a film, the way you direct a film, the way you shoot a film. Dang, I should have done this. It's an XYZ. Mm -hmm. Didn't need this. But you don't know that if you're not sitting there looking at it. If someone else is doing it. Exactly. Because then you're just sitting there like, oh, everything went great. Everything I did worked and nothing went wrong and blah, blah, blah. And you're living in this little fairy tale land. (laughs) It's like, no, man, you got to learn from your mistakes. Like, yeah. And and you look, if I could look at the younger me and say anything, which I kind of feel like I'm doing with you, I really, I feel a kinship <laughs> little, with you. I feel like you're, you're doing everything I wish I could pop back to 20 years old and do yeah. right now. But anywho, uh, you got to ask yourself, are you in it to win it or not? Like there's so many things I didn't do because I was scared people would label me as difficult or anything like that. And, and, and to be truthful, like 
you have a right to protect the film. Just because you have a new director and he's learning doesn't mean you have to suffer the same mistakes sure. you just learned over and over and over again. That's absurd. Why can't you? What person wouldn't thank you for leveling him up quicker? Mm-hmm. Hey, man, you're about to make a mistake. I did that last time. Don't do that. You know what I mean? Like, what do you mean? You take five seconds to explain it to him. Let him shoot it his way and then shoot it yours. He'll yeah. thank you later. Yeah. Yep. But you do not have to fail to look like a nice guy. And to be honest, fuck nice. Nice is the stupidest thing. I don't want nice on my set. I want good. Don't be polite to me. Be good. Be good. Watch my back. Make sure shit gets done well. Make sure light don't fall on my actor's head. You know, like, make sure the boom doesn't fall on my actor's head. Yeah. Don't be nice. Mm-hmm. Be good. Be good. Be yeah. good. Like, no one wants nice. Like, nice, nice is good for church and, like... <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Wedding together and yeah, yeah, like yeah. be nice to your wedding guests and <laughs> but don't be nice on set, man. Like nice, be professional. Mm-hmm. And professional is telling me the truth. Professional, like I, I'm not always gonna w- want to hear what you got to say. I'm not always gonna have time for it. And I'll tell you when I don't. I'm sorry, I don't have time to hear this shit. Let it go. You tried. You know what I mean? But never stop trying. Never, never be too afraid. I mean, like being too afraid to say something because you might get blacklisted or everyone in town might start saying, no one has the power to stop me from working, especially if I'm good. You know what I mean? There's always going to be that one person who's going to jump ship and be like, fuck it. This dude can help me make my movie the way (laughs) I need it to be. Mm -hmm. I know you guys don't like him, Mm -hmm. but I can figure out, you know what I mean? Like I really believe that those are common things we're all dealing with and whatnot. A DP has a little bit more, wiggle room than he thinks to talk to the director. The director has the same sort of wiggle room with the DP, the sound guy too. Sound guy. The reason why I was able to do sound for Red Hood is because I was able to say, Bert, stop. We got to get wild soundtracks after everything, just in case I screwed up. I knew I had a couple takes of them just standing next to the mic and doing their scenes. And believe it or not, that's why we didn't have to do ADR. And that ADR is better than the stuff we would have gotten in studio because it was in the same location with the same mics. It was all about me just saying, here's what I need if you want the best. Not, you know what? I want them to like me more, so I'm (laughs) going to say nothing. I love what you said about, um, um, and I've heard heard this definitely before, and I've definitely done it, and Mm -hmm. it's been so helpful, is that if someone is so locked down, if a director is so locked down on their idea, and they're just kind of not being very collaborative, like, okay, maybe shoot it their way, but then also be like, okay, but can we also try it this way just to have it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and more often than not, they'll go with the decision that you made to do and, and you know. And if they don't, you still, number one, you are on point. Yeah. Because ultimately. You, reckon, you were yep, able to recognize yeah. that. When the project wraps, what sort of filmmaker are you? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Did you notice? Mm-hmm. Did you notice what was wrong? That's what's most important. Mm-hmm. I, I do a lot of cinematography and, 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 and I'm finally getting into that place where I work with like a list people sometimes. And it's really cool. Uh, I always, I, I, I love that I get briefed on these a listers and I'm always told they like to direct a lot and they like to, and you just get to set and it's, it, I've never met an asshole celebrity yet. They've never been mean to me. They've never not heard me out because they want to be good. Yeah. And when you come at them and you're like, I was thinking we should do it this way even though they don't know who I am and I look like I'm in my twenties, they've never said, get out of here, young dude. Or like, you don't earn the, you haven't earned the right to speak to me. Yeah. Never once they smile and they go, it's actually a pretty good idea. And they'll use a piece of it. That's or great. They don't use it at all. Mm. Like, but voicing it shouldn't be wrong. Is there, is there a bad yeah. time to voice it? Sure. Maybe. Yeah. Better but, times than up. Yeah. 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 So, but I'd say do it. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, do cause it. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a collaborative process and that's exactly. what this is all about. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. anyways, that's about all the time that we have. This oh, was man. like super good. Nice. I freaking love this. Nice. Um, so for some self plugs, um, where can people find you on the gram and find more of your work? Um, you find me on Instagram, uh, at Saber media and yeah. How do you spell, how do you spell that? S-A-B-E-A-R media. <laughs> yeah, everything I do on there. And uh, Red Hood It coming out soon. Mm. Check Robot out on YouTube. Underdog Robot channel. Underdog, yep. The link will Two. be. Two. Robot Underdog 2 YouTube channel. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. The link will be in the show notes and description when it does come out. Yeah. Um, that helps. Hassani, where can we find you? 
You can find me at Hisani. That's H-I-S-O-N-N-I. And I think on Twitter, I'm Hisani J. H-I-S-O-N-N-I J. You are. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> well, thanks again for taking the time to listen to this episode of Pictures Up, especially if you made it all the way to the end. Uh, be sure to leave a review on iTunes and Google Play. Um, it definitely helps with getting this podcast seen and having more people listen to these awesome stories. If you guys were to leave me an iTunes review, what would you guys say? Uh, you know, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Nah, I love right. this show, man. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm a fan. Yeah, I'm definitely, a fan. It's cool. It was well, great. Yeah, Thank I mean, you like for I having us. Like I said earlier, it's, it's just cool being able to talk to people and get there. They, you know, there's so many different perspectives in, in life and and being able to just, you know, mm-hmm. absolutely sit and listen and watch is just really kind of, it's just really insightful. Mm-hmm. And like I said, there's so many variables to, to people's paths and, and seeing other how other people's overcame those variables is just kind of really cool. Um, but of course, be sure to swing by my YouTube channel for more filmmaking content and the video version of this podcast. Thanks again for watching and stopping by. We'll see you in the next one. Yeah. yeah. Pizza! <laughs> <laughs>